Hello everyone. I am Dr. Pablo. I am a uh, veterinary anesthesiologist and I'd like to cover in this uh, presentation will be anesthesia, the different drugs that we use, as well as equipment. And I'm hoping that this, that this information will show up in the North American Veterinary, veterinary Licensing Examination. This, is, this will be the scope of this presentation. First, I will talk about breathing circuits. I will talk about the different anesthetic drugs. They will be uh, classified uh, for like premedication, induction, and maintenance. I'll be, I will also talk about uh, the emerging technology in monitoring anesthesia, and they are the pulse oximetry and capnography. Here's just a diagram of the uh, components of the anesthetic gas machine. The, there are four components of the anesthetic gas machine. They are the high, press, high pressure system, as you could see here, the low pressure system, the breathing system, and the scavenging system. The main gas source that we use is oxygen. That is the main carrier of the anesthetic agent. And as you can see here, it's a tank, and they're usually compressed at room temperature. They exist as gas. The high pressure system is where the pipeline and the compressed cylinder gas are connected. One of the components of the high pressure system is the pressure regulator. What is a pressure regulator? It regulates the pressure as it comes out of the gas source and as it enters the anesthetic gas machine. That is very important because there is a very high pressure in the gas source. That anesthetic machine cannot handle that high pressure. Also, a component or components of the high pressure system would be the pipeline and hoses. Here's a picture of the different connectors, pipelines and hoses for oxygen and nitrous oxide. As you could see here, there is a difference in the size and shape of oxygen and nitrous oxide. The reason for that is for safety. You do not want to interchange oxygen from other gases. The animal will be hypoxic if the animal inspires, let's say, nitrogen or nitrous oxide. The next component of the anesthetic machine is the low pressure system. This is where the oxygen and the, and the anesthetic gas mixture are mixed or blended. The components of the low pressure system are the flow meter from the thermal on, you know that this controls the flow of oxygen. This is a picture of a flow meter. As you could see here, there's a float inside a tapered flow tube, and the flow tube is really calibrated. Each flow meter is made for a specific gas. You cannot use this oxygen flow meter, for example, for nitrous oxide. Different gases have different density and viscosity. Another component of the low pressure system will be the vaporizer. The vaporizers are classified into precision vaporizers and non-precision vaporizers. The most commonly used vaporizer these days would be the precision vaporizers. And this is a picture of, pre of a precision vaporizer. This is concentration calibrated. It produces an accurate concentration of the anesthetic over a wide range of gas flows. There is some temperature compensation in this vaporizer. So it could be a little bit cold in the room. There will be a change in the, there will be a change in the uh, output. Vaporizer is actually a, a, um, an equipment or a part of the anesthetic machine that facilitates the change of the anesthetic from liquid to gas. And whatever you set 
here uh, on the vaporizer, whatever concentration you set should be the percent of that uh, vapor. The next part of the anesthetic gas machine would be the breathing system. Uh, I'm hoping that they will ask this in the boards. And so what I'll do next is classify the breathing systems available to us. They're classified as to open, semi-open, semi-close, closed system. And I will identify these uh, terms for you. For the open system, there is no reservoir for the anesthetic gas mixture. There is no rebreathing of the expired gas. And this is a good example of an open system. As you could see here, there's a plastic chamber, and inside the chamber is like a cotton impregnated or saturated with inhalant anesthetic. And the animal breathes that anesthetic in and out. So again, you could see here that there's no reservoir, there's no bag. For the semi-open system, there is now a reservoir or a breathing bag. Because of the high flow of oxygen used in the systems, there is no rebreathing of the expired gases. There is also no capacity for absorption of carbon dioxide in this system. An example of the system will be the non rebreathing systems. This is an example of a non rebreathing system. This is actually called Mapleson F or Jackson Reese system. As you could see here, this is the co connection to the patient. And there is a tubing right here that is connected to the anesthetic machine. And this is where the oxygen and the inhalant anesthetic will, will pass then into the animal. This, this portion here is the a part that is attached to the scavenging system. And as you could see, there is, there is a reservoir bag and there are no valves in this system. For semi-closed, they have reservoir, just like the semi-open. In this system, there's, there is partial rebreathing of expired gases. And there is a capacity to absorb carbon dioxide. As you can see in this picture, this is a canister, and inside the canister is the soda lime. Sometimes you can also use bottle lime. And the CO2 is absorbed as a result of some chemical reaction. A circle breathing system that uses a low to high gas flow is an example of a semi-closed system. This is an example of a circle breathing system. As you could see, uh, the different parts, there's the soda lime canister, there is the uh, breathing hose, there is the breathing bag, and also there are unidirectional valves that direct the flow of gas in the circle breathing system. The closed system is similar to semi-closed system, except for the oxygen flow. In this system, there is a complete rebreathing of the expired gases. So in this system, the oxygen flow rate that you set should be equal to the oxygen requirement of the animal. When the animal is anesthetized, the oxygen requirement is about 6 to 8 mils per kilogram per minute. This rate can go down when the animal becomes hypothermic. In conscious animals, the anesthetic or the oxygen requirement is about 10 mils per kilogram per minute. And as you can see, when the animal is anesthetized, there is a reduction in oxygen requirement. In practice, there are two main breeding systems that we use. Already mentioned about the non breeding system and the circle breeding systems. In small patients, like a cat or a dog weighing less than 7 to 10 kilograms, we use the non rebreathing system. And for larger animals, those weighing uh, more than 10 kilograms, we use the circle breathing system. And why is that? The non rebreathing systems 
have uh, have less dead space. Also, the non-repeating systems have provide uh, no resistance or less resistance to breathing. If you look at the circle, there is an increase in dead space because of this Y piece. That what in this Y piece there will be some mixing of inspired as well as expired gases, and there will be the breathing of some CO2. So this is where the dead space is in the circle. The unidirectional valves provide the resistance to breathing. And why is that important? Well, if you have a very small animal, and that animal has to breathe through this resistance, that animal, uh, over time, will have difficulty breathing. There will be some fatigue. Uh, that animal will have less energy to breathe and actually will develop hypercapnia as a result of the resistance. So again, we use the circle breathing systems for animals greater than 10 kilograms, and we use the non-breathing systems for patients less than 7 to 10 kilograms. Well, let's now talk about drugs, the drugs that we commonly use in anesthesia. And again, I'm hoping uh, that some of this will show up in your examination. And as I've mentioned, I'm going to uh, classify this into three for the sake of discussion and organization. There will be some overlap. For example, the inhalant agents actually can be used as induction agent as well as maintenance agent. Uh, an agent like ketamine could be used as a pre-med induction agent as well as a maintenance. Let's concentrate first uh, on pre-medication. Why do we premedicate our animals? There are good reasons uh, for premedicating our patients before anesthesia. When you premedicate, when you give a, an animal like a sedative, uh, that really uh, allows you to restrain the animal. It minimizes the stress, it minimizes the struggling of the patient, and makes life easier for you. If you have an animal that salivates, uh, that uh, salivates a lot, you can also use an anticholinergic to stop the salivation. I routinely use atropine or glycoparolate in English bulldogs or bulldogs because they seem to salivate a lot during uh, induction. If the procedure will involve uh, some vaguely mediated reflexes, then it's a good idea to give an anticholinergic. A good example is this case. They'll be doing, they'll be manipulating the eye, and we have what we call ocular cardiac reflex. If that is initiated, there will be sinus bradycardia. And giving atropine or glycoparolate beforehand will minimize the sinus bradycardia that can happen during the manipulation. There are also other vaguely immediate reflexes, like uh, surgeries that involve the larynx. Sometimes if you open the chest and uh, there is a manipulation of the vagus there, there will also be severe bradycardia as a result of that. Another reason for premedication is the, uh, is the improvement of induction and recovery, the quality of induction and recovery. With good premed, you're able to minimize the excitement during induction and recovery. And this is much more important when you're dealing with a very big animal like a horse. Just think about a thousand pound horse that has a very rough induction and rough recovery. That would be uh, very dangerous to the horse as well as to the personnel handling the horse. So we strive for profound sedation good sedation in horses before we induce anesthesia. Another good reason for premedication is to provide analgesia. There is this ongoing uh, principle or um, a uh, practice that we, we uh, follow, which is called preemptive, providing preemptive analgesia. What is preemptive analgesia? Preemptive analgesia simply means that you're providing systemic analgesic, or it could be local analgesic, to a patient before that patient experiences the pain. And by doing that, you're, you are able to reduce the requirement 
for the post-operative analgesic. And the animals seem to be much happier. They feel much comfortable after surgery with uh, provision of preemptive analgesic. And here's just a picture of a patient that has really a bad uh, burn. And in this case, we provided good analgesic. Uh, actually, we gave an opioid as well as some ketamine, which is very good for burn patients. When you give a pre-med, like a sedative, an analgesic, you're also able to reduce the anesthetic requirement. And that is important. You're, you are able to maintain a better uh, cardiovascular status of the animal or condition with a reduction in your primary, in primary anesthetic, like isofluorine. Now let's talk about anticholinergics. The two main anticholinergics available to us are atropine and glycopyrrolate. What are the indications of anticholinergics? Anticholinergics will reduce salivation as well as respiratory secretions. So again, these are good agents uh, for patients that salivate a lot. Again, I'd like to uh, mention the bulldog because this uh, because this dog this uh, this dog salivates a lot prior to anesthesia. How about ruminants? This is a picture of a goat with a lot of saliva. Do we routinely give anticholinergic to these animals? We do not routinely give anticholinergic to ruminants, even though they salivate a lot during anesthesia. And the reason is. You cannot stop the salivation completely in these animals. By giving atropine or glycopyrrolate, you're just making the saliva more viscous. And if the saliva becomes more viscous, that is more difficult to be uh, removed. How about in horses? Do we give anticholinergic routinely as part of our pre-medication? We do not give atropine or glycopyrrolate to horses because of the possibility of ileus or colic. Remember that atropine, like a paralyte, they will reduce the gastrointestinal motility. Another indication for anticholinergic is the inhibition of vaguely mediated reflexes. If there, if there is a procedure that needs to be done, and it involves a manipulation of the vagus, then it is a good idea to add anticholinergic to your premedicants. There are contraindications that you have to uh, remember uh, in, re uh, in relation to the anticholinergics. If the animal has a pre-existing tachycardia, let's say you have a dog with a heart rate of 200 before premedication, it is not a good idea to give the anticholinergic that make it worse. Also, if your patient has cardiac tachyarrhythmia or some ventricular arrhythmia, it is not a good idea to give anticholinergic. Remember that anticholinergics are arrhythmogenic on their own. So examples are premature ventricular complexes. If the animal or the dog or cat has this, uh, atropine should not be given. Supraventricular tachycardia is another example. If the animal has this, we, we try to avoid atropine or glycopyrrolate. Now let's just compare atropine and glycopyrrolate. And these are some of the things that you, uh, you need to remember. In terms of uh, causing sinus tachycardia, atropine will cause more sinus tachycardia following its administration. So, if you, so the practical application of this uh, information is, if you have an animal that is developing bradycardia slowly, and you don't want to see an extremely high heart rate following uh, the drug administration, you better use glycopyrrolate. We routinely use atropine in really emergency, in really emergency situation wherein the heart rate is very, very low because we want a much uh, stronger effect. 
In terms of the duration of auction, atropine has a shorter duration of auction. It actually is supposed to last only in a, last for about 40 to 50 minutes, while glycoparolate can last for as long as an hour or two. Glycoparolate has a bigger molecule, and having a bigger molecule, it does not penetrate the placental barrier as well as the blood-brain barrier. And it has been observed that if you want to control salivation, glycoparolate seems to be a little bit better than atropine. And another, I guess, one last information I can share with you is that glycoparolate is slightly more expensive than atropine. I guess that's the reason why, in practice, most people use atropine. It's a little bit cheaper than glycoparolate. Now let's talk about sedatives, tranquilizers, and analgesics. A mainstay of veterinary anesthesia is acepromazine. Acepromazine is a phenotiacin um, derivative. It uh, causes alpha blockade. And these are the actions of acepromazine. It uh, causes sedation. It has its calming effect. It does not provide analgesia. So when you're using acepromazine and there will be uh, pain involved in the procedure, it is always a good idea to add an opioid or an analgesic to your regime. Age promising because of its alpha blocking effect has some protective action against catecholamine induced arrhythmias. It is an anti arrhythmogenic agent. So if you have a patient that has uh, dysrhythmias, like premature ventricular complexes, age promising can be used. It is an anti-emetic. It is very good for patients that are vomiting. It is known to lower seizure threshold. Because of this information, we try to avoid acepromazine in cases with a history of seizure or cases that are presented with seizure. Acepromazine causes hypotension at higher dosages. I just want to remind you that we don't follow the dosage uh, prescribed by the, man by the manufacturer because that is quite high. We routinely use about 0 0.05 milligram per kilogram IM or sub-Q when we use acepromazine. You don't really need a high dose. That low dose can, will cause sedation and you will see less of this cardiovascular effect. Now, the hypotension that is produced by acepromazine is due to the peripheral vasodilation. Again, this is mediated by the alpha receptors. Acepromazine is an alpha blocking agent. This information is uh, very useful for equine practitioners because they, they did a retrospect retrospective study, a part prospective study, and they showed that when acepromazine is included in the anesthetic regime in horses, that there is lower mortality. I think the reason for that is acepromazine, as we said, is a dilator. So when you dilate the periphery, that helps the heart. It can pump more with slight peripheral vasodilation. There are some contraindications uh, when you're using acepromazine. One, if you have a patient with liver and renal failure, you don't want to use it, simply because acepromazine is metabolized by the liver and excreted by the kidney. If you use this drug, then there will be a very prolonged effect. If you have a patient that is toxic, acepromazine is not a good idea because a toxic patient will most likely be vasodilated and by when you give the acepromazine, that vasodilation will be more severe. It is also not a good idea to use hypo, to use acepromazine in hypovolemic patients as well as patients that are in shock. Remember, these patients uh, may be vasodilated, and if you vasodilate and if you vasodilate the animal, then there will be a worsening of the condition. 
animals with seizure, we try to avoid ACE promising. This is a little bit controversial, but if they ask you about this in your examination, still you don't want to use ACE promosin in patients with seizure. There are people who said, oh, they still give ACE promosin even though the animal has seizure. But again, if you look at the literature, if you check the textbook, still it, they tell us not to use ACE promosin in cases with that in cases wherein seizure is one of the signs. You also have to recognize that uh, ACE promising has been associated with paraphimosis and priapism, priapism in stallions and geldings. What are these terms? Priapism means that there is a persistent erection. Paraphimosis is a condition wherein the penis cannot be retracted, retracted back into the prepuce. Now, we, we try not to use ACE promising in, in very expensive, expensive stallions because of this potential problem. Um, if you manage your animal, your stallions and geldings well, this may not be a big problem. Also, if you, if you use the low dosages of ACE promising, this may not be a big problem. I think what happens is, after ACE promising, the stallions are let loose, and then the penis is traumatized, uh, it gets edematous, and you have the vicious cycle now. The, the penis is edematous, and it's, it's still extended and cannot go back. It's, it still gets traumatized, resulting in the permanent uh, paraphimosis. This is just a picture of a stallion uh, following ACE promising. As you could see, the penis is extended. In cases of overdose of ACE promising, these are the things that you have to do. Because the animal is vasodilated, you have to fluid load the animal with fluids, crystalloids. You can use LRS, lactated ringer solution. You can use Normazole, whatever crystalloid that is available in your practice. Because the animal is also vasodilated as a result of alpha blockade, it's a good idea to give an alpha agonist. This will constrict the periphery. Good example would be phenylephrine. Uh, metoxamine is another drug that you can use. So those are the two main things that you have to do in case of ACE promising overdose. Now let's talk about uh, a group of drugs that's quite commonly used in practice. These are the alpha-2 agonists. Silacin has been around for a while. Meditomidin is still quite new and we have the detomidin, which is commonly used in horses. Let's talk about the actions of the alpha-2 agonists. They cause sedation. They provide analgesia. They provide good muscle relaxation. This is just a picture of a horse that just received silazine. As you could see, the head is down because the animal is sedate, as well as there's muscle relaxation. And if you give base promise in, in, a, in a horse, it may be swaying, or uh, swaying kind of side to side because of the muscle relaxation. Side effects of alpha-2 agonists. They will cause second, second degree AB block. Sometimes you may see a third degree AB block. This is just an EKG of a second degree AB block. As you could see here, there is a P wave right there and it is not followed by a QRS. That is a classic second degree AV block. Another side effect of alpha-2 agonists would be sinus bradycardia. Like in dogs, if you give meditomidin, the heart rate may be in the 40s, and you expect that from med meditomidin. Also, it is known that the alpha-2 agonists increase the sensitivity of the myocardium to catecholamines. So they can actually uh, be, they are actually arrhythmogenic. Another side effect, after giving uh, alpha-2 agonists, it can, uh, they can uh, cause hypertension because of the peripheral vasoconstriction. Then it is followed by hypotension, um, maybe 30 minutes later, as a result of a uh, reduction in sympathetic outflow and an increase in parasympathetic influence. 
Another side effect of the alpha-2 agonist would be a reduction in cardiac output. This is mainly due to the peripheral vasoconstriction. Alpha-2 agonist to agonists can also cause vomiting in some cats and dogs. It has, also, it, is, it has been reported in sheep that pulmonary edema can develop following silicin premedication. Other information that you may need to remember for your uh, licensing examination. Remember that ruminants are quite sensitive to the effects of silazine. For ruminants, your dose is about one-tenth of the horse dose. You also need to remember that silazine will cause premature parturition in the last trimester of pregnancy in cows. So we try to avoid silazine in the last trimester of pregnancy. Now these are the reversal agents of the different alpha-2 agonists. So these are the alpha-2 antagonists. For silazine, the humbin is commonly used as a reversal agent. You can also use tulazolin. This is actually, uh, this uh, tulazolin appears to be more effective effective than euhimbin in ruminants. Another drug that you can use to reverse silicin is idasoxan, not commonly used. For meditomidin, a specific reversal agent is atipamizole. For detomidin, if you want to reverse detomidin, you can use euhimbin, you can also use atipamizole. Now let's go to another group of uh, sedatives, benzodiazepines. These are the two drugs commonly used in veterinary practice, diazepam and midazolam. What is the mechanism of action, action of benzodiazepines? They facilitate the actions of gamma amino butyric acid. This GABA is an inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter. Therefore, if you facilitate that, there will be sedation. And why do we use benzodiazepine as a premed? When you give a benzodiazepine, you're able to reduce the amount of your injectable induction agent. It is also an anticonvulsant. So it will be a good choice for cases with history of seizure or animals that are presented with seizure. These benzodiazepines also produce muscle relaxation. So be, you need to be very watchful if you use this in horses and you, and you give a high dose. These are some of the precautions when you're using benzodiazepines. I want you to remember that benzodiazepines may cause excitement in healthy dogs, those bright and alert dogs, and cats, if given by itself. Actually, I've seen cats that uh, become aggressive following the administration of benzodiazepine. So these benzodiazepines, see, benzodiazepines seem to work better in animals that, that are quite sick. As I already mentioned about uh, benzodiazepine in horses, if you give it, you're going to see pronounced muscle relaxation with mild sedation and making it very difficult to control the horse because of the muscle relaxation. So you have to be very careful. And again, this is the reason why it's not commonly used in adult horses as a sedative. You also have to recognize that diazepam precipitates with most drugs when mixed in a syringe. Ketamine is one drug that I know that can be mixed with diazepam and there'll be no precipitation. But over time, when, when you see the, the uh, solution, the uh, combination, the diazepam and ketamine, there'll be some gel formation. So when we mix the two, we immediately administer uh, the uh, combination so that we don't have to see the gel formation. The specific reversal agent for benzodiazepine is flumazenil. So this is a drug that I think you have to remember because they can ask you this question. 
flumazenil, that is the reversal agent for benzodiazepine. So it can reverse diazepam, it can reverse midazolam. The next group of uh, tranquilizers, sedatives, uh, this group is not commonly used. Examples are droperidol and azaparone. They actually work just like uh, the uh, just like acepromazine, the penotiazine. One difference that they have weaker alpha blocking effects. I just put this one here because this is a potential question. If they asked you what is the only tranquilizer sedative that is approved for use in pigs, the answer would be a zaperone. Let's talk about the opioids. Why are we using opioids as pre-med? They provide analgesia. They provide very good analgesia. They provide some sedation, those dependent. When you give opioids, you're, el you're also able to reduce your anesthetic requirement. Opioids, 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 they are good for patients with poor cardiovascular function. Opioids are classified into pure agonist, agonist, antagonist. Examples, some examples of the pure agonists, these are the drugs that, uh, that we use in the clinic, morphine, meperidine, fentanyl, hydromorphone, oxymorphone. These are all pure agonists. So they stimulate the mu and the kappa, and they produce analgesia. Now these are the agonist antagonists. One example is buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is known as a partial agonist on the mu. It has a strong affinity on the mu receptors. So what happens if it, when, it, when it binds the receptors, the other agonists cannot work on the mu, hence the designation agonist antagonist. Another opioid is butorphinol. This is an agonist antagonist, and you could see here that it is uh, antagonistic on the mu, and it is agonistic on kappa. Now mu mediates this, the supraspinal analgesia, while kappa mediates the spinal analgesia. You can actually use butorphinol in cases of pure agonist overdose. As you could see, when you give it, it will uh, antagonize the mu effect, but still you will have some analgesia as a result of its kappa effect. Another agonist antagonist that's available is nalbufin. It is antagonist on the mu and partial agonist on the kappa. These are some of the side effects of uh, opioids that uh, they, they can ask in the licensing examination. Opioids stimulate the uh, vagal center, causing sinus bradycardia. That is easily abolished by the use of anticholinergic like atropine, glycoparolate. Opioids also are known to cause vomiting. Not in all dogs, but maybe 50% or so will, will have some vomiting. Some opioids, or few opioids, will not do this, like uh, butorphinol. Opioids are also known to cause respiratory depression. Based on our experience in the clinic, dogs and cats are less susceptible to the respiratory depressant effect of the opioids compared with humans. So we're not really worried about high dosages of opioids in our clinic. Opioids can cause excitement or dysphoria in some animals. When this happens, we usually give our patients some acepromazine or maybe some diazepam to minimize the excitement. Animals that uh, have opioids also are more sensitive to the noise. And the thing that we do in this case is we put some cotton balls in the ear, in the ears, so that there will be uh, less response to the noise. Opioids can either cause depression or stimulation in different species. 
causes CNS depression in the following animals, dogs, rabbits, and monkeys, while in horses, cats, pigs, ruminants, opioids cause CNS excitation. And again, that's the reason why when we use opioids in those species, we have some sedative on board. Like in a horse, you just cannot give morphine. You'd like to give some silicine before you give morphine in horses. The specific reversal agent for opioids is naloxone. Now, there also, there's also a combination called neuroleft analgesic. This is a term that uh, you may have heard before. This is actually a combination of tranquilizer and an opioid. And I will give you some examples. This is, a, uh, this is like a combination that I, re that I really like, diazepam, the tranquilizer, oxymorphone, the opioid. And I use it to sedate uh, sick animals, really sick animals. It provide this combination uh, provides analgesia as well as uh, sedation. Another combination, neuroleft analgesic combination that uh, maybe you have used, is a combination of ACE, promazine, and butorphenol. ACE, the tranquilizer, butorphenol, the opioid, and this combination provides very good sedation, profound sedation, and there is the analgesic effect of butorphenol in this combination. This is another example of a neuroleft analgesic, midazolam and morphine. Midazolam, the tranquilizer, morphine, the opioid. And I like this for patients that are painful and patients that uh, have mild to moderate systemic disturbance because the midazolam is uh, better in these patients. It does not depress the cardiovascular system as much as like ACE promisin or xylosine. Well, let's talk about the, the dissociatives. They can be used, as I said, they can be used as pre-med. They can all be used, used as induction. They are not the typical CNS depressant, uh, like the uh, barbiturate. They cause unconsciousness by the uh, dissociation between the thalamocortical and limbic system. Examples of dissociatives, ketamine, and the thiletamine. Thiletamine is one of the two components of telazole. Ketamine is only approved in cats and monkeys because uh, ketamine will cause sedation. In other animals, when you give ketamine by itself, there will be like 30% chance of seizure, so they're not approved in other animals. Remember that ketamine is only approved for use in cats and non-human primates. So it will cause, you know, they, the ketamine will cause sedation in cats and monkeys. The dissociatives, the dissociatives will cause, will provide analgesia. In our clinic, we've been using infusion of ketamine as well as low dosages during surgery because ketamine is known to stop the wind up. And what is wind, wind up? Wind up simply means that during surgery, during the surgical stimulation, there may be some hypersensitization of the nerve and that hypersensitization will actually uh, cause or will need more analgesic to counter later on. So by giving ketamine, we're able to stop the wind-up, this hypersensitization. This is actually mediated by, by the NMDA receptors. The good thing about dissociatives, they stimulate the cardiovascular function. Side effects? They can increase salivary and respiratory secretions. They cause muscle rigidity. That is why we provide muscle relaxant or we add muscle relaxant to our regime like uh, diazepam. It's quite painful an ion injection. And they can potentially cause seizure. So animals, again, with seizure, you don't want to use a dissociative agent. Let's talk about the drugs that we use for induction. High barbiturates. Again, this is uh, a mainstay of veterinary anesthesia. Thigh barbiturates. Thigh barbiturates are ultra short acting barbiturates. And the two examples are thiopental and thiamylol. Thiopental is the one that uh, we use now. We used to use thiamylol, but uh, the production was stopped many years ago. 
and it has not come back. I see this is a preparation of uh, thiopental. It comes as a powder form, and then we reconstitute that before using it. We'd like to give it slowly to produce anesthesia because if you give it rapidly, it will cause apnea. So I already mentioned the side effect apnea, and to minimize that, we, 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 we give our thiopental slowly. This may be the reason why thiopental is not as popular as uh, diazepam ketamine for induction because of the higher incidence of apnea. It depresses myocardial contractility. Because of this, it is not a good choice for patients that are hypovolemic or patients that have problem with myocardial contractility, like a dilated cardiomyopathy. If you give thiopental as a rapid bolus injection, ventricular bigeminy can happen. And this is just an ECG of ventricular bigeminy. You could see here that there is an alternating normal sinus rhythm and a ventricular premature complex. So this is known as ventricular bigeminy. You don't have to treat this. Uh, once the concentration of the thiopental goes down, once thiopental is redistributed, this can go away. What you need to do is, uh, you need to ventilate. You need to ventilate your patient when there is ventricular bigeminy. If you give thiopental perivascularly, it can cause sloughing of tissue. Thiopental is also known to cause prolonged recovery in greyhound. And if you use thiopental as maintenance agent, you expect prolonged recovery. It could be 24 hours. So we don't use thiopental to maintain anesthesia because of that. So what can we use for greyhounds if we cannot use thiopental? We've used propofol. I will talk about propofol later on. It's a good drug to use for greyhounds. You can also use methohexital. Methohexital is an oxybarbiturate. You can also use telazole intravenously in greyhound to induce anesthesia. And you're going to have acceptable induction. Maybe the recovery uh, will not be as great. You can also use a combination of diazepam and ketamine to induce anesthesia in greyhound. And a combination also of xylazine and ketamine uh, in healthy young patients will be acceptable. Now let's talk about propofol. As you could see, propofol is colored. Propofol comes in as a white emulsion. And why is that? Because that white emulsion is made up of soybean oil. It is not a barbiturate. It is known as a substituted isopropyl propyl phenol. What is the significance of this? Being a phenol, cats cannot handle this drug as well as a dog. What do I, what do I mean by that? We said that the main advantage of propofol is the quick recovery. In cats, the recovery is slightly prolonged compared with the recoveries in dogs. It produces, it uh, has a rapid onset of action, even IV, and also it has its rapid recovery. And one good thing about propofol is that it has it has little hangover effect in recovery. It means that the animal has this psychomotor function back much sooner compared with the other induction agents. It is a hypnotic. It induces sleep. It does not have analgesic property. So again, you have to give some opioids or analgesic when you're using propofol if the procedure is painful. The most common side effect of propofol is apnea. So make sure that you remember that. It is the most common side effect. It can also cause hypotension. Now, to minimize the incidence or to reduce the incidence of these side effects, it is always a good idea to give propofol slowly. We actually give propofol over 40 to 6 over 40 to 60 seconds. Actually, the main advantage of propofol over thiopental is that we can use it to maintain anesthesia. It has a very short elimination half-life. That even if you maintain anesthesia uh, using propofol for four to six hours, you're going to have reasonable recovery time. The 
dissociatives as induction agent. Again, we have the ketamine and thylatamine. They produce unconsciousness. Uh, this agent, these agents produce good somatic analgesia, but the visceral, visceral analgesia is not as good. These are the cardiovascular effects of the dissociatives, ketamine, thylatamine. They do this by stimulating the sympathetic system indirectly. They increase heart rate, increase cardiac output, and increase blood pressure. So this is the drug I'd like to use in animals that are like hypobulimic, animals that may be bleeding because they maintain a cardiovascular function better than, let's say, propofol or thiopental. It has also been observed that there is less apnea when you use propofol compared with thiopental. I'm sorry, uh, less apnea when you use ketamine compared with thiopental and propofol. Side effects of the dissociatives. We already mentioned about the possibility of seizure, muscle rigidity. They can increase the intracranial pressure by increasing the cerebral blood flow. So this is not a good drug to use for patients with brain lesion. They can increase the intraocular pressure. Again, this would not be a good drug to use for patients with, uh, with glaucoma or patients with uh, corneal laceration or patients with some corneal ulcer, deep corneal ulcer that, uh, that can actually make the condition worse if there's an intra increase in intraocular pressure. Other effects of dissociatives. When you use it, you could see that the eyes remain open and you'll see an active palpebral reflexes as well as corneal reflexes. The animals also retain the pharyngeal and laryngeal reflexes. The animal can still swallow, but bear in mind that uh, they can still aspirate even though the animal can still swallow. This is another information that uh, can help you. You'd like to avoid ketamine in cats with renal insufficiency because majority of ketamine is excreted and changed by the kidneys. So if you have renal insufficiency, there will be more active forms staying in the animal. These are some of the ketamine combinations uh, that uh, you can use or you may have already used. Salicin ketamine, ace promacin ketamine, diazepam ketamine, midazolam ketamine, guaifenesin ketamine. The guaifenesin ketamine combination is used in horses. Tilosol can be used in dogs, cats, pigs, and horses. When you, you use tilosol in horses, you have to use uh, a premed like silazine. In pigs, what I'd like to do is give tilosol IM and complete the induction with a face mask. In dogs and cats, you can use tilosol as IM injections as well as IV injections for induction. There is a difference between dogs and cats in terms of recovery. It has been observed that uh, cats have better recovery following tilosol injection. And there's an explanation for this. In dogs, sulacepam is metabolized quicker than thylatamine. It means that the, there is a lingering effect of thylatamine causing this rough recovery in dogs. On the other hand, in cats, thylatamine is metabolized quicker than sulacepam. So in this case, sulacepam, which is a tranquilizer, uh, has a longer effect than the thylatamine, which is the dissociative. And again, this explains why uh, there, is, there are better recoveries in cats as a, uh, following telosol injection compared with dogs. Let me just mention uh, something about guaifenesin. So you could see here, uh, this is a horse that's going down and there's a bag of guaifenesin we use for induction. Guaifenesin is a centrally acting muscle relaxant. It is used in horses and cattle for induction together with thiopental or ketamine. It does not have any analgesia. The next part of this uh, presentation will be the agents that we use maintenance. I will concentrate on inhalant anesthetics. We can maintain anesthesia using inhalant as well as injectable agents. 
But again, for this discussion, I will concentrate on inhalant agents. These are the agents that uh, we use, halothane, isofluorine, sevofluorine, methoxyfluorine, nitrous oxide. There's a term known as minimum alveolar concentration. We also, we also call this as MAC. What does it mean? It actually indicates uh, the dose of your inhalant agent. MAC simply means that it is the end-tidal concentration of the anesthetic that will result in no response in 50% of the patients when exposed to painful stimulus. So in essence, this is an ED50. It indicates the potency of the agent. So let's look at the different MAC. Metoxyfluorine, 0.23%, halothane, 0.9%, isofluorine, 1.3%, sevofluorine, 2.4%, nitrous oxide, 188 to 200. As you could see here, the most potent inhalant anesthetic, if that is us in the board, will be metoxyfluorine. It has the lowest MAC. And you could also see here that nitrous, nitrous oxide is not, that is not really potent. It cannot uh, produce anesthesia on its own. It has to be uh, used with other inhalant agents. Another term that, we'll, that, uh, are, that is pertinent when we're discussing inhalant anesthetic will be solubility. The solubility, that is the blood solubility of the, of the inhalant agent has an effect on the rapidity of induction and recovery of the patient. So simply, the more blood soluble the agent is, the slower the induction and recovery. So the target of, or the mission of these uh, different manufacturers is to find an agent that has the least blood solubility. The solubility of an agent is determined by what we call blood gas partition coefficient. So this is like the comparison of the amount that is in the blood as well as in the gas at, equi at equilibrium. So remember that the higher the number of this blood gas partition coefficient, the more blood soluble the agent will be. So let's look at the blood gas partition coefficient of the different agents. Methoxyfluorine 13, halothane 2.3, isofluorine 1.5, sevofluorine 0.68, nitrous oxide 0.49. As you could see here, sevofluorine has a very low blood gas partition coefficient. And that is why sevofluorine compared with iso, halothane, and methoxy has the quickest induction and recovery. They can also ask you about the degree of metabolism of these different inhalant agents. And that's the reason why I put this one here. You could see the numbers, methoxyfluorine, it is 50% metabol metabolized, halothane, 20 to 25% metabolized, sevofluorine, 3% metabolized, isofluorine, 0.2% metabolized. You could see here that uh, maybe the best agent for patients with the liver problem may be isofluorine because it has the least metabolism. And if they ask you about the agent that is metabolized to the greatest extent, then the answer would be methoxyfluorine. Let me say something about nitrous oxide. This is a tank of nitrous oxide. At room temperature, and when it is compressed, nitrous oxide exists as a liquid. When we use this clinically, we use 50 to 70%. What do we, what do we mean by, by that? So let's say you're running your oxygen flow at one liter per minute, and you set your nitrous oxide flow at two liters per minute because of this one is the two uh, partition, then the concentration of nitrous oxide the animal is receiving is 66%. Now, if we change this oxygen flow, if we maintain the oxygen flow at one, and we keep the nitrous oxide flow at one liter, then that will be 50%. So that's how you set the concentration of the nitrous oxide. As I've mentioned, nitrous oxide is not potent enough in many species. It would not cause them 
to be anesthetized, therefore it has to be used with a primary agent like halotain or isofluorine. Another thing that you have to remember about nitrous oxide is that it is not a, an agent you want to use in patients with pneumothorax as well as patients with obstructive, obstructed bowel. And the reason for this is that when you give nitrous oxide, it is, quite, it is very soluble. It diffuses quickly to this gas packet and expand, it expands the gas packet. Now, nitrogen is less soluble than nitrous oxide and it stays. So what happens when you give nitrous oxide, there's this expansion of this gas packet worsening the condition of the animal. Another inhalant agent that uh, has been used for many, many years, halothane. The main problem with halothane is that it sensitizes the heart to the effect of catecholamines resulting in ventricular arrhythmias. And so it's not a good choice for patients with arrhythmias, like patients with gastric dilatation and volvulus, traumatic myocarditis. These patients, uh, more in most of the time, will have dysrhythmias. This is just an example of a premature ventricular complex. As you could see here, there's a premature complex. This is wide and bizarre complex. And uh, usually there's no P wave. This is just the order of sensitivity to, to uh, catecholamines of these inhalant agents. So again, just a quick review here. Halotane is the is really highly arrhythmogenic. The second in line is methoxyfluorine. And these two, sevoflurane and isoflurane, they don't sensitize the heart to the effect of catecholamines. So they're very good for cases wherein there's an existing dystrytmia. You have also to remember that halotane directly, depre directly de uh, depresses the myocardium. It depresses the ventilation in a dose-dependent manner. It increases cerebral blood flow, and that is the reason why it may not be it's not a good choice for patients with brain lesion. How about methoxyfluorine? Methoxyfluorine is not uh, presently available in the US. It has a very low vapor pressure. What is the significance of this? At uh, 700, 760 millimeter mercury of uh, barometric pressure, the highest concentration methoxyfluorine can attain is 3%. And, in the, and add that to the fact that it has a very high blood solubility that makes it a little bit safer in the hands of other practitioners. Methoxyfluorine produces renal failure in animals when administered with other nephrotoxic drugs. What happens methoxyfluorine when given to a patient is metabolized by the liver, and there is a lot of uh, fluoride. And that fluoride, in addition to the other nephrotoxic drugs, will cause this renal failure. Isofluorine. This may be the uh, most common inhalant agent now used in practice. Good thing about this, it maintains cardiac output. However, you have to remember that it can also cause hypotension as a, as a result of vasodilation. It does not sensitize the heart to the effect of catecholamines. It maintains perfusion to the liver, so it's very good for patients with the liver problem. It increases cerebral blood flow, but less than halotain. So we still use isofluorine in cases of brain tumor. What we do is we hyperventilate the patient so that we can reduce the CO2, we can reduce the blood flow to the brain. So it's, it is a drug that can still be used in cases of brain tumor. There is no nephrotoxicity reported with isofluorine. Now the newest one is sevoflurane. This drug, this inhalant agent has very low solubility. So that results in very quick induction and recovery and that is the main selling point of sevoflurane. The cardiovascular effect of sevoflurane are very similar to ISO, except that sevoflurane causes lower heart rate. It can also cause hypotension due to vasodilation. It does not sensitize the heart to, to, to catecholamines, just like isofluorine. It also preserves 
hepatic arterial blood flow so it could be used in patients with liver problem. It does not appear to cause airway irritation and it can be used for mass induction. Sevofluorine alcohol has a very pleasant smell. So that's one indication for the use of sevofluorine is when you're gonna be doing a lot of mass induction. A concern about sevofluorine is the reaction of uh, the uh, CO2 absorbent like sodalime with the sevofluorine producing compound A. And what is compound A? Compound A has been shown to be nephrotoxic in rats at high concentration. However, they found that uh, there's still no evidence that renal failure results from sevofluorine anesthesia in humans because the concentration of this compound A is still small. So this is the last segment of this presentation and uh, I'll just uh, discuss here two uh, emerging technologies, the pulse oximetry and capnography. What is pulse oximetry? Pulse oximetry determines the arterial oxygen saturation of hemoglobin, so you can use it to detect hypoxemia in your patients. There are actually many good things about uh, pulse oximetry. It is non-invasive. It provides you continuous information. It is quite safe to the patient, also safe to you and it detects hypoxemia. Hypoxemia may be the most common cause of mortality in anesthesia. So by using pulse oximetry, you may be able to de detect that quickly and react quickly and maybe save the life of your animal. This is just a picture of a pulse oximetry. As you could see here, there's a probe that is on the tongue of the, uh, of the animal. And 99 here is the S we call SpO2, that is the saturation. And it also provides you heart rate as you could see here, the heart rate is 173. Let me just explain to you the principle behind pulse oximetry quickly. So here's the probe of a pulse oximetry, oximeter. There's a light source that emits two lights, red light and infrared light. On the other side is a light detector. It determines the amount of light that uh, actually passes through the tissue, blood and blood vessels. Now, it so happens that reduced hemoglobin absorbs more red light. So this is, again, a hemoglobin without uh, oxygen. And the oxygenated hemoglobin absorbs more infrared light. So by just looking at the ratio of the absorption of these of this, uh, two lights, then you can come up with an idea about the proportion of the reduced hemoglobin and oxygenated hemoglobin. And that is why you can have this ratio of this corrected absorption at its wavelength, which is the red and infrared light, and that stands for SpO2, which is the saturation of oxygen. So it is done by the computer chip inside the monitor. How do we use this information? Now, actually, this could be explained uh, with the use of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So let me explain to you this curve. On the x-axis right here, you know, it's really hard to read, but on the x-axis would be the tension of oxygen in the blood. That's the x-axis. On the y-axis is the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. So this is actually the information that your pulse oximeter will tell you. And then you, by knowing that information, then you can have an idea about the arterial oxygen tension. See, we, do not use, we don't want to use blood gas all the time. We don't want to stick our animal all the time and get arterial blood and come up with the arterial oxygen tension. So the pulse oximeter will give us an idea about the level of this TaO2 or the arterial oxygen tension. So for example, if the arterial oxygen tension is 60 using this curve, the SpO2, the saturation of oxygen, is 90. And you all know that 960 millimeter mercury is hypoxemic. So if you have a SpO2 of 90%, it means that the PaO2 of the animal would be about 60, and that's not a good thing for the patient. So let, let's just put this in a table. So here we go. We have here the arterial oxygen tension. And if it's 60, the percent saturation should be 90. As you go down, as you could see here, we're really going low, low, very, very low on our tension. 50, we have 80, 40, which is the venous uh, oxygen, which is now the uh, venous oxygen tension. Then you're going to have 70. 
So the bottom line when you're using pulse oximeter is that you want a number that is 95% higher or it could be equal to 95%. Below that, you have to start thinking about your patient. There might be something going on that you have uh, to correct. How about capnography? Capnography measures the carbon, carbon dioxide concentration in the airway. It, it measures both the expired as well as the inspired CO2 concentration. So here's, the, here's just a picture of a uh, mainstream capnograph. It is actually attached between the endotracheal tube and the breathing circuit. Another application of capnography is during CPR. It has been shown that if you're using it and you're doing chest compression, and if the end tidal CO2 or the expired CO2 is greater than 10 or 15, it means that your chest compression is quite effective. You're making, you're producing some blood flow. So if you have a capnography and you're doing CPR, it may be a good idea to hook it up and see if you're able to produce CO2 when you're compressing the chest. Capnography provides information on the ad adequacy of ventilation, so this can tell you if the animal is severely hypoventilating, so you can do something about it. It can also tell you about the cardiovascular systems. If the animal is severely hypotensive because of the reduction in the blood flow to the lungs, there will be a reduction in your expired CO2. So again, Mainly, we think about capnography as a respiratory monitor, but it can also tell you about the status of the cardiovascular system. It can also give you uh, the uh, metabolic state or the metabolism of the patient. If the animal is undergoing a hypermetabolic state, it will be uh, it could be shown on the capnography. For example, if the animal is developing hyper, uh, malignant hyperthermia, which is hypermetabolic state, you will see a tremendously high expired CO2, even though you're trying to ventilate your animal. Other information that capnography can give you will be apnea. So you, you just see nothing. It'd be a straight line. Expired CO2 will be zero. It can also tell you if there's some airway obstruction. There will be a change in the shape of the capnogram with the airway obstruction. If the animal is rebreathing CO2, you will see on your capnograph that the inspired CO2 is greater than zero. So for our target expired CO2, we would like that to be in the 40s. And again, the expired CO2 is, should be related to the arterial CO2. And if it's in the 40s, then our uh, arterial CO2 should be slightly higher than that. And remember, the inspired CO2 should be zero. I thank you for your attention, and I'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have.